Hello everyone, today we talk about the origins of the Italian communes, which is a very fascinating yet problematic topic because communal history has been studied relatively well in its uh, at the apex of communal civilization, but still its origins and also its decline are relatively, um, you know, um, not really forgotten, but they, they received less um, attention. And uh, we, we can say that not differently from other institutions and many other uh, phenomena of the Middle Ages, the commune, not just the Italian one, because communal, um, the communal phenomenon is um, scattered all over Europe. Naturally, in the Italian peninsula it had this greater, uh, especially in the center in the north, this greater development. We will see now um, how and why also this uh, geographical, um, you know, uh, um, characterization. Um, but it, it's a, fin it's a uh, topic that, say, in general, has been object of a series um, of uh, misunderstandings, we can say, that continue to circulate around, not just in the what can be the popular perception, because, you know, that that's not really scientific in any sense, but just noticing that it's a very... Uh, incomprehensibly underestimated and under-considered topic um, in popular culture, but uh, such misunderstandings are still present sometimes in, in even in school manuals or in, in even university manuals. Um, maybe the, the most updated, hopefully not, but uh, let's say that um, this um, this difference between the perception of communal history and the especially the progresses achieved in the last years of uh, by uh, specialistic historiography um, is is striking uh, in many ways uh, the italian communes um, are also I, I just created by the way a um, dedicated playlist for them i realize I, i've made up to now excluding this video 50 videos on the italian communes so i i'm trying also to bit to fill this gap to to give more um, space to this um, um, chapter of medieval history uh, that deserves definitely a lot, a lot really of attention and recognition uh, because um, not just for the the consequences that obviously brought to phenomena like humanism, the Renaissance, the birth in this environment, essentially of what modern European uh, culture has been for up to the end of the modern age, um, but also for the development in itself. I mean, how were these communes born and what do they represent into the medieval uh, millennium um, in, in a comprehensive uh, fashion? Because what we will try to see today also, among the other things, to, uh, is the continuity that in the Apennine Peninsula existed between the ancient urbanization and the communal uh, the communal civilization fundamentally and therefore I will keep making references to these other videos if you know th there are certain things we will try uh, we will hint at and that you can find better explanations in this dedicated videos um, and um, talking about the um, Italian historiography, which I think is interesting because naturally Italy has been the country that has mm, given more attention, um, historically speaking, to the communal uh, phenomenon, to the communal institutions. Um, and uh, even in here, where the um, historiography on, on this subject is very developed, there is still a, um, you know, the presentation, not that the Italians are doing something uh, particularly negative in the sense, on the contrary, we we all thank them for the the huge amount of, of literature they they produce and they issue, but there is um, still an, imp um, I would say, I, I don't know how to call it in English, wait a second. Even in here, a setting. Uh, sometimes the the easiest uh, words in 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 the languages are not properly. They they don't have, they do not have proper correspondences to uh, to others. Whatever. However, it's there is a general setting, a general conception, preparation on uh, or uh, of this on works on um, communal Italy that still present. Um, 
in the case specifically of, of the Italian Middle Ages, the communal civilization, in a certain sense, as the most characteristic um, datum of um, of medieval Italy in this case, which is a tradition that um, fundamentally stems back to to, to the Renaissance. Hmm? The Renaissance had, um, as you know, this, um, and, and therefore at the very end of the same communal civilization in many ways, because in fact the Italian Renaissance was born in the cities, and those same cities that had been, and that, keep, that were keep being communes fundamentally, uh, around which the uh, Italian regional states and seigneuries had developed and towards uh, the Renaissance now were developing this um, historical reinterpretation that was on the lead in Western Europe and that was stressing in that case uh, because of the uh, Renaissance fascination uh, with, especially with classical and, and, and with Roman past um, the um, idea that the development of the uh, communes had corresponded fundamentally to a um, the re, uh, revival, if you want, of the ancient uh, Roman, uh, I would say municipal uh, civilization in some way. I stress municipal, not just urban, because you know many uh, you know the medieval civilization has seen more or less everywhere the development of cities in progressively or a long time but naturally not all cities had this uh, municipal pride this autonomy this capability of you know being active actors around acting even like entire states hmm? managing huge amounts of money that not even the the most powerful kingdoms in Europe for, is, for instance had had available so um the idea that the development of the communal uh, world was somewhat similar, at least in, in civic um, ideal, uh, to the ancient Roman uh, political model of citizenry and, um, you know, of, of chivas, in fact. So, citizens of a city that was developing as a political body, fundamentally, uh, as an institution in its own, was pretty much alive in there. And it was seen as a great achievement back in the day. So still today, um, this um, tradition uh, in Italian historiography, som sometimes in part, not that this is forgotten or uh, misunderstood, but it, it, it still brings, even if from a quantitative point of view, a much a greater, so much greater uh, attention to the communal phenomenon, and um, keeping in the shade, if you want, other aspects. Um, of it that are kind of not less important um, and this happens both towards the communes and towards other entities towards the communes as we were saying before um, with an attention chiefly towards the uh, not just even to the to the communal history as such I mean the history of the, s the single city the single institution etc but also from the perspective of um, politics and institutions I mean, for instance, the, the military element that has been practically at the base of the foundation of the Italian communes is very, uh, you know, is, is kind of um, overlooked. It's, um, it's, it's most an institutional history. Um, it's been, if you want, much more concentrated on the uh, juridical ideals, on the, um, uh, on the, um, on the institutional transformations, even in moments in which these transformations were occurring through uh, other phenomena that were mostly political and military uh, and that instead have been left kind of and there is also this comparative nature of the single communes saying you know let's take a look at what happens in, in the Italian um, communes at this time and all together from an institutional point of view and say uh, at the anti-nobility laws of the end of the 13th century let's compare them all and let's um, therefore abstract them from the single local reality and just try to, to make something global. Uh, I mean, not global in this case, but, you know, looking at, at that specifically and not what was happening, uh, in fact, all around that. And therefore, somehow abstracting a little bit this institutional form as the commune as a sort of an hypothesis of a greater political model. Mm -hmm. 
um, that is said was resenting since the very first beginning of the relation with the, all the other actors that existed on the territory. And at the same time, also this latter that we just named. I mean, uh, medieval Italy, even at the acme of the communal civilization, was not just a, uh, a an area of uh, a region of of cities mm, or communes. Uh, the feudal element also existed in two Italy. Um, a feudal element that fundamentally is the one from which the same commune stems. We will see it with the uh, stand of the uh, milites and of uh, therefore the the knightly elite that also is uh, the in fact the same the very creator of the commune uh, and that remains in in at the head of of the commune up to you know for 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 a good century of, or more and um, that uh, created the, the consular uh, the consular regimes fundamentally they were the first ones that, that, that established the same communal institution um, but the, the feudal um, the feudal element that also kept existing outside of the communes often very close and in a constant political dialectic with the same cities um, very often in conflict, but always w with a sort of compenetration, fundamentally, at a political, uh, with an intersection at a political level. But also areas of Italy that were feudal, for real, I mean, that there were several areas, and we'll see now, that had this um, very strong, also they were incidentally the, the least urbanized of the peninsula, that maintained a very uh, relatively strong feudal character. Of course, not like in countries like in France or in Germany, because the cities now were taking over literally, you know, the most powerful and wealthy areas, so the productive areas, so they were kind of choking the feudal um, class, if we want to call it in this way, which is uh, extremely ugly. Let's find another term. Uh, uh, say the feudalism generically, but um, the persistence of this uh, uh, feudal element also in the following uh, affirmation of the seigneuries. Mm -hmm. The seigneuries were uh, in part a sort of comeback of the same feudal element into the life of the Italian communes. Now it's relatively complicated to explain and today we will not do it because we'll try to, to look at the origins proper. So, you know, the, effort, the, the rise and consolidation of the Italian lordships is something that comes uh, later. In, the, in this sense I made a couple of videos. The first one is ah uh, here. I forgot to put it into the playlist. However, um, one is uh, the one I just told you now: rise and consolidation of the Italian lordships, mid 13th, mid 14th century. The other one I'm I'm adding now. I have to search, but it's kind of a bit difficult. However, is the one on the f very first lordships that are also very kind of underestimated topic at the um, fundamentally during the, the during the mid around at least the mid thirteenth century. If you give me a second, I give you the title. Um, there is also the the crisis of Italian communes that deals with that in part more generally, also from the perspective of the. Um, of the popular, I mean, the, yeah, the popular element that had kind of taken over over the feudal element at that point, um, but they're they're always intertwined. I mean, there is never a moment in which in in these communes the the popular element and the feudal element kind of um, disengaged. I mean, they they stayed from one side and one for the other. Um, the title I wanted to give you is this one: the first Italian lordships. Ezzelino da Romano, Oberto Pelavicino, and William the Seventh of Montferrat. Um, this also is particularly interesting for dealing with that. But today we will stick to to the origins, to the initial side. So, um, so it's evident that even this, um, that, that immediately, even given this very, uh, very, sh you know, small picture of the wall, um, the. Uh, communal phenomenon is way more com complex, at least than what is usually pictured. I believe that the general perception of the communes around is this 
weird thing that happens in Italy uh, at a certain point with cities that develop. It was about merchants, and that's it. They were wealthy. They made art, and and it is it was a much more complex and conflictual, and also very brutal, and, and violent world that um, has to be understood also in the relation of this um, of of with 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 commune with the surrounding powers, what they had been the, the center of powers, also in the previous in the previous centuries, because as we said before, the commune isn't born out of out of nothing. It's actually even relatively problematic, problematic to, to tell when the commune actually uh, w- was born. Because in most of the cases, we, we don't even know. I mean, even for some of the most important cities, um, it's kind of obscure when this all happened. In, in a certain sense, it doesn't even... It's not even really so extremely important, because the, the, the idea is that still something in terms of uh, political cohesion existed before. We know it. You know, the aristocracies since early medieval times, uh, the time of the Longobards, for instance, still were uh, very active, compared, especially to in Italy, compared to the rest of the European ones. But the same, um, talking about a European perspective, this the communal civilization, as we've said, is something that existed, of course, also in many other uh, countries. Southern France was uh, relatively similar to Italy. Certain areas of northern Spain uh, were kind of like that. Also, northern France sees the, the rise of con- consistent centers that, you know, it, but mostly it's about Flanders that has, uh, after Italy, this um, other, the second, you know, place, if you want, in terms of the development of, uh, of cities, of urbanization, and of, of uh, local autonomies. Um, this happens in the Rhine Valley, in southern Germany. So there are phenomena like that, but kind of in Europe, um, nobody reaches the, you know, the the utmost, uh, I would say, um, uh, uh, you know, stage of, of development that uh, that happens in the Apennine Peninsula, um, <clears throat> for reasons that we discussed also other other times. If you want, there is here. Uh, a video that explains from a kind of a structural point of view, that is the demographic expansion of Italian communes, that gives you also some numbers about that. Um, remember that also in terms of of size, you know, one-fourth of the Europeans at this time were, were Italians, because they were essentially living in these areas, not only not all in cities at all, the majority of, you know, during pre-industrial times, every civilization ever existed had the, the, the vast majority of inhabitants in the countryside. But also in the case of the communal world, the countryside was extremely important. The countryside was constantly controlled by the city, differently from other areas of Europe where you f- could find many rural areas that were kind of out there on their own. Uh, <clears throat> even in, in countries like France and naturally also in Germany. Um, and uh, but that had different history of urbanization um, in many ways, um, but also from an institutional point of view, I um, made this other video that is called "Between Diocese and Comitatus: The Expansion of Italian Communes." And instead, gives you the perspective mostly from from an institutional, in fact, point of view, the relation with the bishop, uh, counts, and all that stuff that we also see today in part. Um, yeah, this is more or less it. But uh, sticking to the European perspective, um, what is important is that um, wherever there are communes in Europe, so now without exceptions, still um, it's not all about the communes. Uh, even if our um, mindset is naturally polarized by the element, um, of the, by the urban element, because it, it was in a, in a certain sense the cherry on top of a system that was developing and that we often can't see. Because it's a matter of surplus. This also this happens in history all the time. That we basically get, historically speaking, uh, mostly um, from the past back the evidence of those who could produce something that went beyond just working the land. So it's like the Roman Empire. It's, it, we, what do we see about the Roman Empire? The big monuments and infrastructures that they built. Why? Because they had a huge surplus to spend. Well, but medieval civilization is a bit the same thing. If you look at, uh, I don't know, the Gothic cathedrals, 
well, it's pretty much all all you have, aside from some castle, some smaller palace, because all the rest didn't produce enough surplus to build more existent uh, structures, if you want. The same goes for Italy, in many ways, in, t- in the field especially of art, of um, of studies, of, uh, of law, of the development of humanism, the Renaissance. Uh, what you have is this amazing, uh, you know, uh, relics of the past that however do not make you show that behind that there is essentially the sweat and tears of, of, of millions of people who worked for making it, having it built chiefly from the peasantry fundamentally, so this is also important um, do not, uh, that we, we it happens in history all the time, we get mostly polarized by the big thing the spectacular thing the, the thing that we can most mostly touch and see and um, and and we, we we get our attention is polarized. But the same goes for historiography. You know, we give for granted certain things because they're being written in, in, on a source. It's maybe it's the only one that has survived at a time where other other ten about which we don't know. But our mind revolves fundamentally around it. So for Italy particularly, uh, but also for the other European uh, countries, um, definitely the Middle Ages was not at all exclusively tied to the cities, not even at the acme of their development, and there are many other elements in there that, albeit less, uh, you know, um, you know, less evident for, for some reasons, uh, were still there and were important political actors. And instead now, concentrating specifically on Italy and going on with this last consideration, um, in, in the history of, of Italy, fundamentally, you talk about this communal era, or communal age, or whatever, communal period, uh, whatever, that is more or less comprehended between the, um, and this is curious already, between the 11th and the 14th century. Um, first of all, we will see that, today we will talk mostly about the before, so the 11th century thing, um, but even the 14th century is is even more arbitrary because we'll see that now the communes existed way i mean not as such as institutions but you know I, I, political bodies in urban life or existed but especially the 14th century the 14th century as a an, a sort of end of the communal period is kind of um brutal in many ways because first of all why would this the end date has been chosen well fundamentally for the rise of the seigneuries for the la- rise of the so-called lordships now guess what where these lordships were developing in the cities on the communes and the communes were not wiped away uh this is important even in general considering medieval mm, political and juridical par- particularism you realize that even the Italian regional states that were formed at the end in this 14th, 15th centuries were fundamentally uh, gravitating around cities. I mean, all the great powers like you know Milan, Venice, uh, the, even the papal states, Genoa, Florence, uh, so encompassing eventually all Tuscany, were gravitating around a specific center. They weren't you know things like feudal entities, etc. And not only, they were not just gravitating around the capital, but their government was um, anchored at a uh, you know, at a territorial level on all the various cities that these bigger ones had managed to subdue. And these cities were all communes. I mean, institutionally speaking, even when the seigneuries rose, the seigneuries rose f- from the same commune. And they didn't stop it, they didn't put an end to it. The seigneuries were working, theoretically, on on paper, let's say, obviously n- nature was very different, on behalf of the commune, from an institutional point of view, also because the commune, as we'll see now, had acquired a freaking lot amount of, um, of 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 political and juridical prerogatives during, and especially during the 14th century, because it was transforming properly into an Italian city state. In fact, most of the times you search about the communes, commune is um, this word that is. Perhaps, in my opinion, the most accurate, the, the most historiographically correct to define the period, because that was the commune, communis, 
Uh, it came from Latin. It meant uh, fundamentally something that is in common, that community. Uh, that, that, that's the meaning. It's as simple as that. Um, you will see that also it wasn't a single thing. It was born like, like that at uh, the origins. But the, the commune, in fact, um, was being defined mostly as a city-state exactly at the end of the communal civilization. So you might say, well, why? It was strengthening, it was acquiring more power, it was becoming, as a matter of fact, a real, kind of a real state. Take Milan, you know, its political and administrative uh, system was impressive, it was one of the most, at the thresholds of modern age, it was one of the most modern out there, most even more centralized in the peninsula, etc. Um, yeah, but historiography is weird and doesn't consider, in fact, the 15th century's communal period. That's the age of the seigneuries, right? Well, yeah, but these seigneuries were ruling from the same commune, so were still existing um, as political bodies, bodies with their magistracies, with their uh, assemblies, of course, and now were all bended to the rule of, of the great lord, that, however, was presenting himself as a sort of overlord that still maintained uh, in the perfect uh, ancien regime um, uh, is, is a customary system uh, the, uh, the the local autonomies, the local laws, they were not erased. Of course, some were trying to, um, just like Milan. Now, Milan is kind of the, the brightest example in this process. We will have to deal with it also on SharePoint. They were trying to uh, homogeneize fundamentally this, um, especially its um, administrative structures. So, trying to, to flatten a little bit the thing for the sake of, you know, building something more central. But this was an exception. If you look in Tuscany, for instance, in Tuscany, uh, there was instead this idea of republicanism, for which Florence was a lordship de facto, but still behaved as if, you know, it was a republic, and uh, it didn't rule over the rest of Tuscany, uh, but you know, just controlled and protected these other cities. Uh, but this also happens because Florence objectively doesn't have such a huge coercive power over the rest of Tuscan. In fact, at this time, it's not, neither able to, to encompass the whole region. But um, aside from this, um, this is a, a, a problem, you know, especially towards the end. But aside from this communal uh, definition timeline, there is also what we were talking about before, that is the continuation of the um, weight, of the great weight, that the feudal feudal institutions um, had in this world. Hmm? Uh, they were scattered a bit all over, because in literally in every single Italian region you find uh, certain feudal lords that, of course, get essentially get choked, but even in the most urbanized areas, in the ones where incidentally the communal phenomenon is in fact more developed, that is Lombardy and Tuscany, uh, you find feudal lords even in there that still are part of the of, of the system that naturally get over the centuries progressively, uh, but not always in the same fashion, the same degree absorbed by the commune. Many of these um, lords sometimes became in fact either uh, they always had naturally their properties in the countries, their estates, but they they also kind of urbanized, and that had been the, the same origin of the commune back in the day, of this uh, feudal nobility that had decided to to that it was more profitable to extend its power in the city, into the city, and to uh, always in tandem, by the way, with with the countryside, because also great part and this, this has never to be forgotten, great part. Of um, this, this is in general for every kind of city in 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 the urban, you know, in excuse me, medieval Europe, um, the the great expansion of cities during the Middle Ages was started by the feudal system. It wasn't something that emerged in opposition to the feudal system. Eventually, these centers grow powerful enough to to put themselves in a political contrast. With a, with feudal, uh, you know, with a feudal element, but at the same time, it's, it's still a bit the, the same actors, um, so it's kind of blurry and complicated. Excuse me, I, I I drink a little bit.
and as I explained also in that video that I told to you about the rise of the Italian lordships um, it's in areas like uh, Romagna and uh, the uh, Venetian region, Veneto region that the the first lo so-called seigneuries or lordships um, started roughly around the, the half of the 13th century so also in here if you want to take arbitrarily or approximately or conventionally the the end of a uh, communal era like the rise of lordships that just know that this also is something that that happened relatively early um, and it had definitely many many intersections with all the rest of it because consider that these lordships also were born uh, over several cities at once, especially these first ones, was trying. There were some fundamental experiments of um, that were still happening when the cities were too strong to be controlled um, directly and individually. It was just a, a way of putting things together. It, it's a bit like the Lombard League, uh, a bit like the Venetian leagues, league. Um, so these sober, you know, cities that recognized fundamentally the need of associating in one way or another in case of the Lombard, uh, the Lombard and the Venetian League that was a kind of a more um, egalitarian thing I mean it was a free con contract etc. Here with lordships it was a bit difficult because the lord was also a political and military leader but still it was mostly the cities initially that were entrusted in power and this is by the way how the seigneury was born which I explain in also in that other video on the rise and consolidation of the Italian lordships. But just for saying that this um, you can't also deal with the single uh, commune as if it was a thing on its own, just with its own countryside and uh, not looking outside. Because this is what happened in other regions of Europe, where uh, maybe the commune within the city walls were, was very well developed, but then you know, it controlled a very small area outside, didn't have practically any power because there were other princely uh, lords that controlled. This is the case of Germany. Germany has, in part, uh, this kind of communal development, but in that case the communes never take over the uh, the nobility, the rural, the feudal nobility in, in the outside. It's a very different thing. It would be interesting to make a video when they comparing um, the various communes of Europe and you know, observing their their <laughs> their differences um, and similarities, um, etc. Um, so the um, and 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 considering also another factor is that the evolution of the commune into the seigneury is not something also in hi like in all times in history that you have to understand as teleological. I mean, the commune theoretically could have its own devil. In fact, you see, even during the 14th and 15th century, um, there is a big difference between the, the, the various lordships in Italy. I mean, they all have a kind of a different character. It's very evident. I made that video, for instance, on... Um, let me uh, search for it. Um, it was, well, whatever, I will add it later, but it was on the, the one... Uh, on that dealt with the 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 political thought. If if I'm not wrong, going uh, by memory, uh, it's the political thought in 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 Florence and Milan at the time of humanism that deals in that case with the um, the different um, ideology that the different lordships were developing regarding to the idea of uh, tyranny and republic, obviously in a classical fashion. So not tyranny as we mean it in a dramatized fashion today but you know the the idea of a fact of a single ruler um not a body of um of of commoners um and there is a general hypocrisy from both sides but it's nevertheless very fascinating because that also shows you what the uh, the 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 political thought had been evolving like in fundamentally in humanism and in the renaissance so in a certain sense these were the the wor workshops of modern political theory, uh, eventually. Um, so, 
the communes could have also evolved in a different fashions. And and every what is interesting, I find particularly fascinating, the medieval, which is valid for the Italian communes, but more in general for every single medieval uh, community, is that. Um, the differences. Every commune had a different story. You can't say, you know, this is this institution in, is in here, so you can find it in other communes. Yeah, sure, there are the consuls, there are the podestas, there are uh, the, uh, the the lords, too. But um, also in here, every city kind of developed this in different forms. Some even skipped them, part of them, or uh, the same origin of the commune was different in terms of, you know, some communes were rural communes, like there were a bunch of villages that in high middle ages had uh, conglomerated and declared themselves as communes, but other were cities of ancient urbanization coming from Roman times, think about Milan, think about uh, Bologna, think about many other centers, but the um, uh, the the idea was the same that is oh yeah that by the way when we talk about the communes um we often look at the um political map of italy at the time and we say okay we have all these usually they're all like you see them as small provinces like every this this chunk of land with a city in it and uh, some of the maps that i've put in this video as well that give you an idea and what you see there oh so how so many so fragmented also, especially if you're used to, you know, more compact uh, medieval domains like, I don't know, England, France, or Castile, or something like that. But even in there, what you see is actually only the biggest communes, because sometimes there were smaller cities, smaller towns, or villages that had actually a communal organization. Because we will see also how fluid the concept of commune really is from an institutional point of view. What what is? Is that it's just an association. It's not there's nothing categorical in it, in the ways it, w it was organized and so on. So basically what you have is also communes since the very beginning of communal history that expand over other communes. Chiefly the smaller ones, but also uh, the most powerful cities began to expand on, on also on the uh, kind of the largest ones. That's what triggered, for instance, the first uh, campaign of Frederick Barbarossa into Italy, because fundamentally the, the, there were certain Lombard cities, chiefly Lodi, that had asked help to the emperor, uh, sought, uh, sought uh, the, the, the imperial help against Milan. It was overexpanding at the time. I made a video, incidentally. It was one of my very first ones, that is... Um, Milanese expansion during the 12th century. That gives you an idea of how this was relatively progressive, but fundamentally started since that time. And um, if you're interested in Milanese history, um, and this is a bit later, mostly at the affirmation of, of the Visconti lordship, but this also this uh, this sums up something we were talking about before. It, the, this video, tyranny as a lesser evil. The Visconti Lordship. That's also uh, interesting because it's um, you know, it tells you how even these political upheavals that are not really in at the end of the so communal era was not really a moment. It was a dramatic moment for many reasons, but it wasn't really the commune didn't really uh, end um, as such. The same lordship kind of stamped from the same commune and from the need of the citizens in many ways that were counterbalanced at that point between the need of security and the need of uh, freedom so they were trying to balance it out through this um, even pacifiers that the lords were originally speaking meant to be and that objectively become uh, albeit making progressively lose the, the, the citizenry its political autonomy and uh, freedoms and so on. Um, so it's a complicated history in many ways, but nevertheless it makes it more fascinating. Um, so continuity is a key word, both at the beginning and the end of communal history. And uh, there are fundamentally, I would say, two elements that characterize uh, markedly the Italian communes and that brought them to, to what they, they 
eventually become. Uh, the first, w the first one is co the continuity of citizen life. Um, er, um, relatively to what had been the Roman antiquity and the early Middle Ages. So this is a, a very important point. You, you objectively, the, the Italian communes could have not existed without the ancient uh, urbanization of Italy. Italy still had all these infrastructures that were, you know, just thinking about having a, a city wall at the time. What it really meant. It's not that, of course, the the Roman cities uh, emerged uh, at this point, uh, you know, reemerged uh, like they were before. There were lots of transformations, etc. But um, uh, the, um, the, the somehow the these local communities had made these entities more autonomous, so they had kind of also reinforced them in a way, given always the the context uh, of, of the time, the ma the possibilities of the time, to make them be something more more autonomous on their own. Mm -hmm. um, this also is important for early medieval times. Because you can't understand the Italian communes if you really don't know the importance that, for instance, cities had into under the Longobard Kingdom, uh, the importance they 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 had also in the Ottonian um, policy in Italy, the creation of the bishop counts um, that were the you know essentially the only means of control that the Ottonians could have on the peninsula, and and therefore if you see it in perspective, always the 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 key um you know the 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 key importance that cities had for the government of Italy in general in in other countries it wasn't like that in other countries power was in many ways much more rural of course um the main powers especially in western europe um were gravitating around um certain centers that however were more kind of a logistical Basis, like, but you know, the the, the majority of power came from these enormous l estates, especially in the in the most intense feudal Europe, that had a, a largely rural culture. And um, in um, the Italian communes were naturally based; their their power was based on rural culture as well. But the Italian countryside were very, very different from other countrysides, especially in northern France, in Germany, or England, where um, a it, it, w it was historically a very different thing, uh, as we were saying before. Basically, in Italy, the word no, there was no our area of the countryside that was detached from from city life. Um, Italian countrysides were also literate, in part. Uh, interestingly enough, they were connected to this traffic now that had a very direct. Um, connection also with with trade uh, with the um, the main trade routes, the sea, the the, the position of Italy in, in the middle of the Mediterranean is a key uh, importance uh, key uh, feature here, um, and also the relation with with continental Europe, uh, you know that that was what made, for instance, especially the, the Po Valley so so rich because the Po Valley. This is interesting because in, in Roman times the Po Valley was a kind of a, uh, especially towards late Roman times a uh, relatively there were important cities, but they they mostly had a military a strategic importance etc. As crossroads etc. But it, the Po Valley had been in integrity a sort of disconnected region from the the majority of um, international traffics. Usually things pass from southern central Italy into uh, southern France, that were the main routes. Now, the, the Pau Ballet in early medieval times becomes something incredibly, you know, uh, it accelerates uh, incredibly, and fundamentally the, the, the rise of the communes happens in Lombardy. Like Tuscany had uh, a later development, later development than, than Lombardy, perhaps a more um, radically republican one than Lombardy for reasons that also now are complex to explain, but it's nevertheless important because the traffic between the, the Mediterranean and continental Europe all passed from the Po River, the Alpine passes, and these were all controlled by these Italian, these Lombard cities. 
Um, so this pre-existing, this continuity is very important. The other, the second element, the second key element, in my opinion, is the. Um, I can't say really the antagonism, but uh, uh, that actually explains it very well in, in most of the cases. But in general, the the political dialectic with surrounding territories, um, meaning that the the communes always had this constant relation. They were never isolated, fundamentally. And if you see what the most important communes fundamentally were, the, one, the, the, the ones that lasted the longest in general, and became more powerful, were all pretty pretty central, in many ways. Uh, Italy also has a very uh, demic, uh, high demic concentration. I think still today in Europe is the country that has the highest demic concentration, given the the, the territorial extension. Um, simply because, in fact, th there is geography in here. There, there is the Apennine crossing in the middle. So, aside from the Po Valley and certain other uh, hill areas in in the in the center, and a very few coastal plains in the south, uh, what you have is that that cities are all pretty close. Uh, that's why Lombardy and Tuscany also so this major phenomenon. Also, because the the rest of Italy was geographically speaking not so. Uh, I mean, not as favorable as those areas. As it's not that it, that the communes didn't develop in there; that the communes developed basically everywhere. But of course, the communal phenomenon was kind of uh, kind of different. But these are, I would say, the um, the major, even distinguishing features of the Italic uh, communal movement from the rest of Europe, from the the the, the rest the, the the European, the rest of the European one. Um, there is also another chapter that is important. It's not perhaps being um, described um, with the due uh, attention. That is this idea that uh, Italy was fundamentally split in two parts, or in uh, or in three, depending on how. If you want, fundamentally you have the north and the center, where you have the development of communal civilization as we know it. So it's fundamentally northern and central Italy that assumed this um, kind of uh, s very similar and comparable phase. Mm. Uh, central and northern Italy at this time were also pretty much in contact. You see that especially at the acme of Italian, um, uh, oh, excuse me, of a communal civilization, the uh, communes from of uh, uh, Say of 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 these two areas, um, exchange constantly all their uh, magistrates. You know the, the podesta that were fundamentally not just low experts, but they were growing mostly as political and military leaders. Made a living as professional figures, basically going uh, from city to city, uh, mandate after mandate, and uh, and you can imagine in the how uh, these areas of the peninsula shared so much in terms of political culture, legal practice. Um, in this sense, the communal civilization is very homogeneous. Um, if you study the source, even linguistically speaking, there's, there's, there is this idea that Italy was always kind of a fragmented thing where people kind of didn't understand each other from place to place. But if you actually read the chronicles that were written separately all over communal Italy, and you read them, I mean, aside from the ones that were still written in Latin, maybe if you read them in vernacular, re realize that they were essentially writing the same language. And not only, not only they understood each other, but they also shared the same identical. First of all, they knew everything was happening everywhere, literally. I mean, even in the rest of Europe, these were the cities that lent money to to France, England. That th therefore were 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 they they had seats. Um, um, you know, banking uh, interests and branches and filials all over Europe. They knew everything was happening in the Flanders. Uh, they were they knew how because that was the hub of their their wealth and so on. So they knew literally everything was happening everywhere in all the other cities. So the, this idea of the closed Middle Ages, the moment where you know news were obscured, people were ignorant, didn't uh, study. I don't know. 
14th century, 13th century communal Italy and tell me back that it was the case. They they had a huge interaction. This is important. And this favored the homogenization of their practices. Not that they were very, di very different from even from the previous centuries, but definitely communal civilization is this continuous ferment of contacts of um, uh, even uh, war. These communes, think about all the leagues that he created to fight also against each other and so on, they, 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 they were practicing the same way. There were mercenaries coming from all over. All over. You realize this. Um, the political and military practice really homogenized communal Italy in many ways. Uh, but the list is very long, uh, and it's really impressive how this system worked. That now, the point I was making is that there is the other, th the other third of Italy, that is southern Italy. Uh, in here, communal civilization is usually regarded to have not um, developed. So there is the problem of the. Um, Italic, Southern Italic Commune that um, had a, a whole different history because it, first of all it was choked, this is the early point, it was choked and emarginated uh, in his cradle fundamentally by the royal centralization operated by the Normans, the Swabians and the Angevins. But in part also it had developed. So southern Italy actually had been historically some of the, it was even more urbanized originally speaking than say the north. This is interesting because you know if you take ancient ancient history you realize it was full of I mean the, the Greeks had founded so many cities anciently they were real cities then Romans reoccupied them found other cities there uh, southern Italy had remained also more firmly within the Mediterranean it had always been closer to the traffics with, with the east, with, with, with the Byzantine Empire, also with the Saracens, um, that weren't, you know, the Sar Saracens, I made a video on the Saracens uh, recently that I, I'm searching, let me search for it. It is rereading the Saracens' slavery, piracy, and trade to me in the Mediterranean 17th, 11th century. This show you how actually the rise of the southern, for instance, the southern um, Italic maritime republics was actually favored by the traffic with, with the Saracens, with how uh, central and northern Italian maritime republics like Pisa and Genoa, for instance, expanded fighting against the Saracens in the Western Mediterranean and recovering, basically, getting the upper hand eventually, but fundamentally also trading with them. So here the relation is complicated, and normally speaking, the, the, the version is in fact that, you know, the Normans arrive, they, they basically flatten the um, chronicle um, particularism that had characterized Southern Italy in the early medieval times, and they choke everything. And this is really in part true. Um, but, in, and so, it's as if the communal phenomenon, because one thing is the urban development, and another thing is the communal phenomenon. So, indeed, the communal phenomenon was not really discarded, um, but it simply couldn't find many options to, to develop. But still, you know, even in the Southern Kingdom, the... Um, now, naturally, this happened also because the Normans imported feudalism that, generally speaking, it was well started into southern Italy, so it immediately had this very strong pressure on the local communities. But it's not that these local communities actually abandoned their own mm, forms of organization. Most of the southern Italian cities were, of, um, were, first of all, usually coastal centers, so they were also partly the ancient... Um, Byzantine um, principalities and duchies that had been, you know, organized also uh, with the influence of the Byzantine administration as kind of a autonomous political bodies in some times. They were kind of uh, city-states uh, legitimately at the time. There were many, many of them. 
at the time thinking about uh what about uh Naples uh Gaeta uh thinking about uh, Amalfi that also rose as in fact a, a maritime republic of it and it was the first one. The first Italian maritime republic is conventionally regarded to be Amalfi that indeed has a not only the word others, but also in here it's approximated. But uh, the point is that it was the one that had the major development before the ones in central and southern and uh, northern Italy uh, began to develop. That uh, eventually became the, the most powerful and developed ones, like Venice and Genoa, etc. But also in the case of Gen uh, of Venice, sorry, you realize that that there was a Byzantine um, land originally. So. Um, there were forms of organization that developed uh, earlier, if you want, in southern Italy, and eventually were choked by the Normans. Amalfi, for instance, was... Uh, it took some time to... Even when the Normans conquered all kind of mainland, uh, southern Italy, it, they... I don't know if you... Have you ever seen how Amalfi is located? Fundamentally, is there is a steep um, cliff on, on the sea. And that's where the city is, and it's very difficult to reach from 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 land. So basically, the Normans took a while before they they managed to to subdue it. Uh, because another key, um, think about the logistics of the time. I mean, it's difficult if you don't have ships to besiege a city from from the sea. Uh, because uh, you know, if you can't blockade it. Uh, it's not it's not much you can do. So medieval logistics were actually extremely developed and sophisticated, but there were certain evident, um, let's say, physical problems that also brought certain of these entities to, give, given their geographical location, to survive for some autonomy for some time. And also in here, the Normans really didn't go, if I'm not wrong, very very harshly on them. And of course, they they stemmed their power. They were probably uh, very imposing, but you know, these cities, even in southern uh, Italy, kept living under the Normans, under the, uh, the Swabians, under the Angevins. They never reached, once again, the, the, the power, the, <laughs> excuse me, the autonomy, the wealth of the uh, northern republics. But they, um, they were still used also by the, the royal um, authority to counterbalance the power of the local barons that were kind of the main problem of these kingdoms, these feudal kingdoms. And it's not a surprise in this sense that the final decline, let's say, at, in, in terms of political autonomy of southern cities uh, in the uh, Apennine Peninsula is um, overlaps, uh, it, it's in, it goes in parallel with the decline of uh, a central authority in the kingdom of Sicily, because as long as the Normans ruled, you know things were more or less fine. And there is this problem of the Swabian succession. I've made a couple of videos on them, you know, one just recently, and 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 then the the war that opposed, you know, the Crusade of the, the, the against Manfred, uh, the the war with Conrad, I mean the Angevins that come in, and in that case there had been a kind of a mess in which the ba the local barons had taken over. And at that point, the monarchy was kind of like, okay, if we, if we really want to rule in here, we have to listen to these guys, because there is no way we can make our way uh, in the country uh, on our own without the support of these people. So, these barons were n mostly feudal. I mean, they, they were uh, involved, surely, also in maritime trade, etc., but at that point, they were mostly in agricultural, uh, agricultural powers. So what happens in these big cities is that they, the barons take over politically. I mean, not maybe just in the city, because the city was still kind of a royal domain, so there were royal office, officials and so on. But at that point, that's in fact royal officials or barons that were not the local councils, the local assemblies and so on. So these big cities in southern Italy uh, keep actually growing and developing during this time, but mostly as great market centers for um, close to great uh, co um, coastal plains, I mean to, to the coastal plains where some uh, there are enough agricultural resources to be produced. Um, I think of great markets of s cities like Bari or or Catania or this why that, that kind of grew consistently, but in this sense not not from a uh, from a political point of view.
even well into the modern age and even uh, the beginning uh, the, these were kind of the, the largest cities in Europe but they they weren't uh, autonomous political centers like the one in, in the centers and in the center and in the north of of the peninsula so <coughs> excuse me I drink a little bit Nevertheless, we're still talking about the Middle Ages, so we can't even be so drastic by saying you know, these cities didn't have a real communal development. They had. Simply that it's been overlooked. Uh, because it produced less, and uh, it gave less results. So it, always, it was always framed into an institutional uh, system of the kingdom. So Southern Italy is a bit aside in this in this context and it has a different a different development now going back to the development of the communal now chiefly northern and central Italy um, the origins proper now it's rather in the 10th century that the real roots of the communal phenomenon have to be found this naturally overlaps with the you know, rebirth that in spite of all the second invasions um, actually was occurring in Europe from that century onwards. It's not that here, it's just, you know, cities had keep, kept growing, so we're not looking at urbanism specifically, but it still happens, you know, also urbanism grows naturally, that's something the commune, the commune goes in parallel with, but it's from the 10th century, that from an institutional point of view, something new starts to happen. And it's kind of interesting because, in fact, of the second invasions, because you might think that this hunger, um, Viking, and um, and Saracen uh, raids uh, fundamentally could um, hamper or reduce the the emergence of um, of local um, of autonomous uh, political centers fundamentally, but it's exactly the the opposite because, in many ways, this Iron century, as it's sometimes called, brings to the need of the uh, local for the local communities to organize themselves in an em emergential uh, condition, chiefly for the sake of their own defense. Uh, this is very important in the birth of the Italian communes. I mean, the military uh, character, the political and military character of this uh, of this growth. So, in a certain sense, it's, it's in the 10th century that premises of communal life in the Italian cities take shape. So, these were communities that were um, put under a constant pressure. Um, they were exposed to dangers. Um, as we've seen, um, in, in, in for the coastal areas, it was mostly uh, because of the Saracens. There were some there was a biking raid once, I think it hit uh, Liguria and Tuscany. And, you know, there were lots of pirates going around. Uh, that's what triggers, for instance, in the case of the Italian maritime republics, the, the rise of their, you know, this kind of, not just economical power of these cities, but their, in fact, their shipbuilding capabilities, their arming capabilities, their ability of projecting their fleets their, and fighting against the Saracen piracy and eventually defeating it. Uh, uh, since by the eleventh century, fundamentally the, the tides have turned. It's it's the Christian side that now gets the upper hand on the Muslim one. It is kind of declining, contracting. Well, this happens in this case. Uh, if you're interested in the Italian maritime republics, I haven't created a dedicated playlist. But in the Italian communes one, um, uh, you, f you can find it. Up to now, I uh, you know if you're interested about this. The, the the video on the Saracens I told you before was kind of cool because it gives you also in here the kind of the prehistory of the wall, which we can also not see very clearly what it was. But um, there's also Italian maritime republics, when wealth and power in the Mediterranean, 11th, 13th century, the now prevalence of Venice and Genoa. Uh, it is something in Genoa too that uh, if it's think about the it, Genoa, it's, it's a lot of videos here lacking in the playlist, but whatever. Um, the Genoese expansion uh, in in uh, that's also if you if you 
search for that on YouTube you should find this stuff um, in the interland the, the main problem were the hungers telling the truth the um, actually the Saracens hit hard in places like Piedmont as well is also a continental area of Italy uh, the Saracens from Fraxinetum even I mean aside from Provence and northern Italy they also raided up in, in, into the Rhine Valley I mean they literally arrived in Germany to, by land um, so you, you can understand also how permeable the borders were but mostly um, northern Italy was hit pretty hard by the hungers the hungers made a freaking mess they even destroyed some, some of the most like I think the, the palace of Pavia was raided by a irrepa irreparable loss in terms of sources and stuff so moment of great Toughness fundamentally, and, and there is the uh, old thing here. It's problematical the history of encastellation into Italy because, in spite of all this violence, actually encastellation began began to rise mostly because of the local uh, wealth, rather than for strictly defensive reasons. But whatever, um, because simply the proof is that basically the, this ca there were entities that, that built castles just to sell them. So to make a living out of this activity, which is pretty interesting. Now castles at this time are, are you have to imagine like things like moat and bailey, of course the the stone ones were another matter. And essentially there are a few in Italy because there was not a central monarchy. In fact in southern Italy you find them, because in that case you had the feudalism that could draw all these massive resources into concentrating only in one place. The Italian communes didn't have many heavy castles that actually they began to build too um, but they had their own cities that in terms of fortified centers were kind of a an amazing thing to to even think to in fact sieges of other cities I mean from city to city were pretty rare because it, it took so many resources most of these cities singularly didn't have just you know when when the the the, the 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 German the, the the emperors arrived from from Germany. They they usually mounted up the ex expeditions, engaging the 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 faithful um, Italic cities and so on. But for the rest, you know, even you know, infrastructurally speaking, a city was something incredibly sound at the time. In fact, it was a nightmare even for the German emperors to fight into Italy because aside from the fact that, that of course, every city they had to besiege it fundamentally, uh, w even they raised it to the ground, the, the Italians ba basically rebuilt it in, in a few years. The case of Milan was raised to the ground by Frederick Barbarossa. After a couple of years, the Milanese literally rebuilt it from scratch. So the, that gives you also the, the idea of the wealth that existed at this time in terms of resources. We're talking about the 12th century. Uh, something amazing. Uh, you don't find it in other areas of Europe. Um, so, under the, in, into this tormented phase of the 10th century, going back, there's a sort of emergential social life that needs a local uh, political body, a magistracy, fundamentally, that could have a... Um, still a actually a spiritual power but chiefly also a temporal one and in that specific war emergency and an effective credit so a figure that could be unitary effective and recognized well in the Italian cities like in most of the cities of Europe at this time there was one figure that was at as the center of this who was the bishop the bishop um, had um, uh, was es essentially the the um, the uh, the center around which new um, political bodies were kind of developed. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually stemmed from representatives of the local community that always had always existed the bishop in this sense being the effectively the most powerful authority in the city was the one you would go, you would interact with for everything in terms of political, military organization, administration, economy and so on. 
So there were already in Italy these uh, elites, um, these urban elites that we know were pretty active since, since ever, practically, because even in the, say, darkest hour of the early medieval times, you, you still find in Italy these cities that, in spite of contr the, the, the demic contraction, the economical um, crisis and so on, still, you know, had a political life in this sense. They, they built, there were beautiful uh, epigraphies from those times that, that actually talk about their, the civic pride of, of the family who was living there. So not just the usual dynasty that says, okay, I'm cool, but I'm cool because I'm in dynasty, but because I live in this city. So you find here the municipalism that is very anciently rooted into these communities that conceive themselves chiefly as the city. This is important. This is not to be given for granted. In, in, in medieval times, living into a city means to, to live in a universe on its own. Something you literally feel like a your whole world. It's something you, you could die excuse me, you could die for, to fight for. So this was also the, the, the political horizon. So you have to think about that. Is that, yeah, okay, I, I told you before that, uh, you know, yeah, these cities were kind of aware of what was happening around, but fundamentally, um, even if you see on how the political and military clashes among the cities originate, it's always about, like, my city against your city. It's like saying, um, it, it, it's as if these elites re realized, obviously, and this is logical, because if you, can, if you analyze the strength relations, you, you understand perfectly that the main objective was to control the city. Because that was what made you far powerful. If you control the city, you could do a freaking lot of things, and, and put yourself at the center of a system that at this point was even kind of international, because the Italian city-states at this time were, in fact, crucial in uh, things like, you know, the clash for investitures between the papacy and the empire. I mean, they were literally in the middle, even geographically speaking, between Germany and, and Rome. So, it, that, that's, um, they were very important logistical points. That's why the, the German emperors, the first thing they do when they come into Italy is to assure that they have enough, uh, that they have a, a, a you know, a net of cities that is, is, is going to support them in order to pass through the peninsula to reach Rome to be crowned and basically all the fights between the, the, the Welfs and the Ghibellines are based, I mean, not really on, only on this, there's also in fact the municipal hostility at the local level, but just to make you understand that this was also an international system. They weren't the small cities concentrated on themselves. The small towns you imagine in, in, you know, the average town. Now, these were actual, uh, were cities, literally cities. They were not towns, were not villages, were cities real, for real, capital C, you know. That was the point. Um, so, there is all this body of, um, it's even difficult to define because it was actually also quite mixed, that was made up by several, say, figures. From one side, um, you you have basically a ruling class that also cooperates with the bishop. The bishop needs the bishop rules from the city also because historically the city had maintained this kind of a administration from Roman times. There were people who could write, who could administrate, who could concentrate in here. That was the market. There were the city walls. So also the countryside was engaged and it revolved around the city. As we have seen, so there were people who were had, who had always been administrating all of this, and is a ruling class. It's a very mixed origin in many ways. First of all, um, this also varies according to place to place because it's, you know not all cities are the same as we said. But chiefly, you had, especially at the beginning, the minor representatives of the feudal class. This is very important. The feudal class is still out there even if most of the feudal uh, estates are outside the city, because that's how fundamentally the Carolingians had, had developed the thing back in the day when they had conquered Italy. They, they, they had done a bit like in, in, in France, in, in Belgium. They, they give all this land 
in the countryside to, to single people. Italy before was not like that. Uh, it, it had, there were very few uh, big estates and uh, very small compared to the, to the one of in, 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 in France, for instance. So Now, this had been exported into Italy as well. We are in the 10th, 11th century, so now feudalism is kind of developing. Uh, it's still on the rise, so it's still developing. So, but at this time, the, the feudal classes had always, ca especially in Italy, had still um, had grown initially competitive um, with the cities that now were because uh, 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 until you have a, a chiefly agricultural economy, now the center of power is the feudal estate in the land. This is valid for all of Europe. But when you start having cities that make a lot of money, you also on the market, the agricultural goods are get devaluated. So the feudal class loses a bit of power. So what, it do, what they do cleverly, since they're still strong, and they're still the, the military class, they're still the war professionals, with force, with with their influence, etc., um, they get urbanized, they get gentrified, they, they go living literally into the city, um, and that's why if you if you go into vacations in Italy, you still see this all these in this uh, I don't know if you go into Tuscany, it's a more representative or Umbria, etc. You you find in these medieval cities with all these many towers because that's that's where this feudal military class starts building these things. And um, exporting this kind of, it's like importing the castles into the city, literally. It's like that. All these many towers, naturally, some were also part of the popular class that had, however, in that sense, a bit uh, become part of the knightly militia. So there was living a, a, a similar feudal lifestyle as well. There's a lot of mixing also in between these two kinds of culture. I mean, the feudal one and the urban uh, one in, into Italy. Um, this feudal class was known as the uh, milites, so the basic uh, term that you find all over Europe in Latin to uh, define the knights. Mm -hmm. uh, milites is the plural of miles, so the miles was literally the, the knight. And this becomes fundamentally a militia. Uh, the so-called mil militia in Latin, because that's really, you know, by militia today we mostly think if anything, we think about communal Italy, you think the militia of the commoners, because that's militia. Because today, our militia means just a bunch of scattered guys, I mean, you know, from conscripts and so on. It, militia in Latin is a very different thing. It means literally the knighthood in this medieval context. So it, it, it's actually the, the ultra-elite. Both military, militarily, but also politically and socially. That has the preeminence, even in these cities now. Uh, then there is a, um, another class you can call. Um, also, this is one is pretty mixed. It's difficult to to actually even define the boundaries between these classes because sometimes they are pretty. They're they're actually Italy is characterized in this sense by a great um, social mobility. Like this, this social stance were pretty inclusive, pretty. Um, pretty open in many ways. So this was a sort of proto-bourgeoisie, if you want to define it some way. This was made up by people who actually made money. So the ones who were at this time kind of expanding fast, especially uh, as we've seen it in Italy because of this renewed traffic between East and West, were the ones who literally were had money in hand. These were money lenders, merchants, uh, artisans, um, armors, but especially in the Italian, uh, excuse me, in the city republics, uh, excuse me, in the uh, maritime republics, um, these are the ship owners, the ones who arm, they also give work to the armors, to the carpenters, because there is also a lot of technique that is related naturally to the uh, to ship building, uh, which, with, through which they made money, and so on. So there is a lot of also mater of material culture in here. The city is an important logistical base because it's walled. It can stock a freaking lot of food. Can resist sieges. Uh, it has the actual material. You know the peasantry in the countryside works not to accumulate goods but just to survive. Well, in the city they're well off. The city is is a huge big surplus. 
fundamentally of trade activities of um, artisan activities and so on so um, there are also uh, there is also another class that is part of this ones that is um, uh, made up by the professionals in the liberal arts like medicine or law um, Italy this time has a great development towards these areas medicine because of all the treatises that, that start to appear um, at this point and also coming from the East etc law in the same way because uh, all these trade transactions need people who know how to write, how to count, how to sign contracts, how to certify contracts, mostly in the case of the notaries, who have to know law in order to exercise it. It's all very spontaneous at the beginning. Uh, it actually stems from very practical needs. And this representative emerged from colleges, fundamentally. So they were all coming, in fact, as we've seen now, from their own activities, their own interests, uh, which in sometimes were even conflicting. I mean, uh, as we've seen, urban political life was pretty um, dynamic, and they all had different interests. Politics is based on this. And the um, they had their own college, like in, in ancient Roman times, where these kind of corporations. Now, it's perhaps early to talk about corporations as, as and guilds as we imagine them at the height of its power in fact in the full communal age but they, they were substantially the same thing they were part of you know people who were associated on the base of their same interests the same profession even living in close um, uh, you know in some quarters of the city belonged to them um, so in in here, you you need to find a properly stable stable um, rule. You know, even the bishop that was now the, the most important uh, authority in the city that could be ruled, by the way, also by other royal imperial officials. It, it depends, but it was still a, a very difficult place to control overall. By the way, the the city streets were also very um, difficult to control. Uh, there were these intrinsic limits in the, the, the military art at this point because of lack of technology, uh, you know, for which it was difficult to to seize control over these cities unless you were a, an overwhelming force coming from the outside, when are etc. Um, so d this just for saying that every, I mean, this was not very different from from ancient times for saying even technology is being, but the, the point I'm making is political is that everything was kind of on its own. Every body was perceived as a sort of an autonomous one. So it's from these colleges that fundamentally the ruling class that surrounded the you know the, the, the functionaries of the bishop uh, fundamentally was, was was drawn from. They were called in Latin the so called boni omnes. So the good men. The the idea this this is a term that stems from juridical practice. I mean it's the idea that there are certain men who are um, uh, kind of um, trustworthy that are called also as witnesses, as people who, who have a, a certain weight, as you can imagine, to society, into the community, and they, they have this role of prestige. So they're kind of elite, but they're not just like the Viri Lustres or the Optimates like back in the late Roman time. They are boni ominous. There is also a bit of Christianity uh, into this. I mean, it's the idea that there are people who were also good men, fundamentally, as uh, they, they, they are valid in, in many ways. Um, so, the, this boni ominous surrounded the bishop, coadjuvated him in the governmental functions, uh, um, chiefly and especially in actually the 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 one of temporal government, like they the, the surely the, the bishop relied also on an administration that uh, of, of clergymen that were you know the the most uh, educated at the time they knew how to write to read so they also contributed these things. But Italy is characterized also by this by uh, a lay um, population. This time is very highly literate and um, and that especially uses um, 
writing for a living. In the case of notaries, it's particularly evident. I mean, Italy has a very early and developed uh, a very early developed uh, writing pr uh, uh, practice. Italy produced lots of documents since the early medieval times. I mean, the, the, the literacy in this area of Europe was was very high. So, even in here, uh, the bishop could rely on people who didn't just come from the clergy, from which in, in other languages you have, in fact, the, that it that that it comes uh, from the same time. The, 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 the word clerk comes from to define a functionary because in, in, in those other countries basically every everyone who could read what was what uh, was a clerk was, was a clergyman well in Italy, in Italy it's not like that in Italy you find so many laymen who know how to write we have we're, we're pra uh, we, we practice writing on a daily basis also being taught in the ecclesiastical in uh, schools and this is because this is how it was born um, there weren't uh, public schools at this time. And this is a time, of course, in which the premises for universities, uh, especially with masters of law, in, in Italy starts to happen as a very spontaneous phenomenon. But in this sense, it was beginning in here, like just a guy who knew about law, and our people wanted to learn from him just hanging around, even sitting on a grass field and teaching law in this sense. So it, it, it's very far away from the big university. Uh, of, of the full communal age, but uh, it's still important in here. But uh, the the main schools were the one of of, of the clergy, and they were open to laymen. This is particularly important, and this is true also in other countries, by the way. But uh, in here, the trade activities, the per capita wealth, bring to a higher amount of people who know how to read and to write and to use it because they need it. They need it. It's not pure ideal education. It's that these people needed to write in order to to work, to live. And um, so, um, and and there is at this time a sort of expansion of this a uh, lay, uh, um, I would say, administrator class that fundamentally starts organizing itself also on its own, on the base of what we said before on the base of the families, on the base of the professions, on the base of uh, other groups that had even at least some political interests, there are even certain military brotherhoods, there is. Um, it's very dynamic. It starts, this starts mostly from towards the, the 11th to the 12th century, but it, it, it basically uh, is the same thing starting from the 10th also. And a process that also favors the the triggers definitely the arise of the lay classes is the clash for the investitures because in the second half of the eleventh century, as you know, uh, the 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 uh, ideological clash between the papacy and the empire was put in into discussion the l l l l l the legitimacy of the episcopal powers now just like the emperor was uh, you know uh, essentially criti um, you know criticizing the the papal prerogatives also the uh this local classes of knights of other um, lay politicians were saying okay what about the bishop in our city he's really to govern us by law, does he have to think just about spiritual affairs? Or does he have to have uh, exercise secular power as well? So this citizen ruling class um, that is increasingly led, by the way, by this small uh, feudality fundamentally that had gentrified and urbanized in the city um, starts uh, to acquire a growing uh, self-conscience. And a, a conscience also of their own role into the city, politically speaking. We've seen that, especially the military class was quite powerful. They had in part been their e extra urban p mm, properties in the so called contado. In, in, in Italian, contado is basically uh, the, the idea of uh, this, this city district that emerges from the word comitatus. Mm. Um, 
so it it basically because this um ancient uh, this recreation of Italy that corresponded to the ancient c Roman cities etc had survived into the Longobard times that built its um, duchies on the base of this uh, cities and their diocese because that was the ancient Roman administration repartition destructuation and and in Carolingian times it had become control of the so-called comites so the counts that are also surviving and reconfirmed in Ottonian times that are, remain at the base of the Holy Roman Empire's local destructuation well in Italy this had happened on the uh, on the base of the cities that was the uh, the 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 milestone of the territorial control the keystone of the territorial controls not milestone and the this is what really starts putting the obviously there were many other interests uh, you can imagine uh the clash for investitures was the main ideological um clash of this high it had reflections on politics but there were even interests. I mean, it's just like with the papas and the emperor. Like, the emperor was a secular power that wanted to expand for because of the sake of money, of power, political... The same the popes, because that's what they ultimately wanted. So this happens also in the city. The city, uh, at this time in Italy, becomes increasing, uh, increasingly more productive. And therefore, there are higher interests that... Uh, are based on Wu is ruling in the city. So, um, what happens is that um, the military class start taking, taking, starts taking the lead. Their urban houses are fortified, towered, uh, they have an actual military power. So what happens is that they start acquiring power um, even in the urban government and this happens actually in very varied ways because you may think that um, it, it's all about a clash between the feudal class and the, the bishop it's not always like that I mean historically speaking in communal era that you find all this you know m the, the most different um, bad companions um, it, it's true that in fact the military class now um, takes uh, on the power in the city um, in spite of or even against the episcopal power but sometimes it also happens in agreement with the episcopal authority which is perfectly um, kind of reasonable because by the way some bishops were also coming now from the the um, coming once again from the same feudal class. This is a big, also at an international level, this is particularly e e evident in the case of um, you know, what the, uh, the Ottonians had done. The Ottonians, in order to rule over these cities, had basically started to do what, I on a smaller scale, what they wanted to do with, with Rome, with the papacy in Rome. I mean, to put their own um, men of trust um, on the um, on the episcopal seat. This could be done because differently from the lay aristocracy were that now had acquired sort of dynastic prerogatives so that a uh, son could succeed to his father in, in, in the communal dignity. Um, now when a bishop died you know it had to be elected just like the Pope so with that excuse the Tonians had increasingly started placing um, their own protege that usually were even foreigners so they 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 hadn't any actual tie with the local uh, with the local politics or even if they did were usually in opposition in fact to the bishops that had traditionally been elected in there just like in Rome like why, why is that the, the Roman aristocracy was so troublesome and and unruly towards the Ottonians it's but because they, they they had traditionally elected the Pope from their own families now the Ottonians came and started electing foreign bishops and said uh, foreign popes and, and uh, saying but what the hell the same goes for with the uh, the the 
the nobility in the rest of the Italic cities. Now the bishops sometimes became men of the uh, sovereign, not men of, of the people in this sense. It's a very a brutal approximation. Obviously it, it didn't quite happen in that way. Also the fact that they were foreigner didn't quite change actually. The, the local affiliations were pretty complicated. But so you find when eventually there is the collapse of imperial authority into Italy that is not revived fundamentally until uh, Frederick Barbarossa, what you find is the bishops also come back being elected by the local nobility and therefore they can be allies as well with, with the military class. Sometimes, most of the times actually it's not the case, they're still in contrast because the bishop in itself owns an authority that that is, is, is different by nature from the lay one. The bishop is con collected with the ecclesiastical elites, with the papacy, it has a certain political direction certain orientation and especially it has certain prerogatives that are traditionally part of that medieval um, institutional uh, system, political system, because the bishop is the bishop, it's not a bishop elected by the local, it's the bishop of that city, of that act, of that in that diocese, in that ancient diocese since a lot of times, so it has in the body of the bishopric really an importance that is opposed in some way to, to the lay one. So what happens is now the delay class takes over in some of the cities and is able either to curb the bishop um, or to expel him sometimes, you know, electing another one of course. But this is important because this is fundamentally how the commune develops. It's very progressive uh, also in here, in certain cities it's, there are more traumatic uh, events, but uh, between, you know, w when it comes to being elite, there is still something in common that you have. So you don't actually kick a bishop out, just all, you try to cope with him. You know, this balance is very progressively shifted in favor of the lay nobility. Sometimes the bishop just finds himself in that situation, he remains there, and uh, progressively um, and in fact, what happens is that the commune is, uh, now we'll see how it starts developing, but it, 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 it often acts on behalf of the bishop, because actually the, per the political prerogatives um, on the district were the Episcopal ones, traditionally, chiefly from Antonian times, in which the bishops were both bishops and counts, or better, they also had comital dignity that had been granted to them. So in the name of that, maybe the the commune had even overthrown the bishop, but we still, s in, in legalistic term, operating on behalf of the bishopric to control the city. So this is very interesting because it's very fluid, gives you the idea of how this political organization was dynamic and original. Because this is very original, this wasn't happening elsewhere in Europe. When, when the Germans come back, with the emperors come back with Frederick Barbarossa into Italy, they, they see what's happened in like um, one century of absence of strong uh, imperial power, and they remain astonished because in Germany they they never seen anything like that. What, what especially uh, aside from the the the, the, the power of the, the, the dimensions of the cities and all this stuff, but what what mostly uh, surprised the, the the Germans is that there could be some commoners, fundamentally, some non-noblemen that, that ruled from the city over the noblemen of the countryside. I mean, this was really the thing that, that triggered them the most at a cultural level, is the fact that this citizenry was made up of people who basically were, were not of the ancient feudal nobility, uh, that now had was ruling basically and swallowing everyone who, who existed uh, around in, in their district. This w was something that you really don't find in the rest of Europe. It was incredible. And and at the same time it opened also lots of opportunities because for, for Frederick Barbarossa, for instance, uh, it was very uh, profitable that there were certain jurists, chiefly the one of Bologna, because they, now they were recovering the Roman right, Roman law, against the papacy, stressing the, the, the power of the emperor over the papacy and so on, but they were 
uh, there was an evident cultural limit in understanding what was going on. And you can uh, reflect that on fundamentally even the the end, the final failure of the attempt of the Holy Roman Emperors to subdue these communities because now they they were really um, aside from the strength and power, there was also some difficulty in understanding what was going on, and and they couldn't conceive such a thing. Because all the rest of Europe functioned fundamentally in another way. There were similar things in other areas, but uh, they, uh, they were much more feudal in nature. And I Italy was something very, very different. And that's what it makes it so characteristic. So it's fundamentally from this system of citizen government that, of urban, urban government, that well, the, the commune is born. This happens fundamentally between the 11th and the 12th century, um, and uh, naturally in these two centuries, as we know, are uh, marked by a, a new uh, economical in, and commercial development of the cities, especially the ones that uh, are have an access to the sea, and um, and in this sense, the, the development of the urban center goes hand in hand also with the development of communal institutions. Mm -hmm. It's very important, especially in this area of central northern Italy that we have identified as being fundamentally a thing on its own. And so the, uh, the, the, the city is basically, and the ruling classes now, that were emancipating from the Episcopal power, understand there is the chance to uh, create a political organization that can be um, fundamentally can frame itself in, in, in terms of public law so they, they, they um, this is also important the communes weren't rebels that wanted to you know to break the uh, the 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 schemes the 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 institutional system oh, quite on the contrary the communes were extremely careful at expanding institutionally speaking in a, in a way that that could be recognized legally by by uh, the the public authority of the empire of the kingdoms uh, even of the papacy sometimes I'm not really aware I could be wrong but you know the idea is still however I indirectly that you had a papal backing even when you know in all these clashes that opposed the emperors with the communes uh, and the papacy etc was was having a, a green light was getting a fr uh, essentially a green light from the pope to say okay you can do it the pope didn't like quite the communes them himself but because obviously they were uh, even in rome it kind of choked the the roman commune but it uh, because they were put, but in the case against the, the the Germans, okay, they said, okay, well, okay, these emperors come into Italy to try to 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 fundamentally to to re reunite this land that obviously I want to take for my own because that was what the, the Pope's intentions really were. So let's bog them down by backing these communes and uh, strengthening them also from a political point of view against the emperors. So this was a kind of a uh, reasonable thing to do. So um, the uh, Dries, the um, this it was being born this so-called communal movement that uh, is backed consistently by also the class of of uh, the stand of the lawyers fundamentally lawyers and have to certify fundamentally the the licity of this new political body that is taking shape the citizen oligarchies made up by the landowners by the milites that we have seen um, that therefore also exercise their trade in the, in in the maritime cities the 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 ship um the ship um building and armoring um um 
activity um, gave therefore place to the birth of s sort of collegial magistracies that were expressed from their own uh, environment, from their own milieu fundamentally, and there, therefore were um, recognized and legitimized in, in various ways by the actually by the episcopal authority of the city or also by the royal one and in fact in the at least in the um, papal territories also by by the bishop of rome himself and this is particularly important because um, wh what you see here is first the commune is um, molded on the base of the pre-existing uh, let's say colleges that existed in two cities that actually most of the times create the commune coming all together as such so creating because commune in itself is a very vague word it doesn't it, it was now especially now being just formed it was just like claiming an alliance between all of these various colleges calling them commune so like we are all together like a community that was it fundamentally and in the name of this you could do certain things if it was legitimized juridically from the other side in fact you have this problem of legitimization that because of political dynamics could be backed either by the bishop that was forced sometimes to do so or by the, ro uh, the, the royal or imperial authority or even by the pope that also had within the papal states several communes that were rising and um, this was naturally happening let's remember it in a world where there were many other powers within the territory so back in a commune was not you know something you would do just because you were obliged or because they you know as a local bishop now you you would do it if, even if you wanted to contrast the uh, uh, some other political actor some like some rural lord this happened the bishop sometime had a leading role in the birth of the commune also in order to 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 stop the um, feudal interference coming from the outside uh, into into the city it was a way to say okay the also the, now the city has a political body on its on its own that is legitimized to do essentially what also feudal lords do and um, and therefore we can uh, it, it enters as a as a legitimate political actor in the public um, in a public system um, this could be profitable in many ways so it's also complicated to sum it up in in a single dynamic because this could happen at so many levels in in uh, i mean uh, uh, for 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 every kind of political combination and it's obvious that this is this is done now we're talking about Italy but just think about Germany Germany is a good example this happens also in France by the way is that in Germany you know that there was a kind of a weak royal authority for which uh, the fundamentally uh, the, the crown depended on the various electors and so on so what, what but there was still a public authority represented by the king by the sovereign so what the sovereign starts doing is to back the so-called Freie Reichsstädte which means basically the free cities of the empire there were cities that even if they pre-existed some of them were founded ex novo actually but that were given certain privileges and rights and so on that were meant to tie these centers directly to the crown politically speaking in opposition to the local princes that were the ones that opposed the most royal power we we discussed that the other day incidentally this happens also in eastern europe in the eastern monarchies sometimes that were that actually suffered of the lack of cities uh, consistently so uh, you know they, they uh, compared to western europe and uh, the the sovereigns trying to back them as much as they could because the their local nobility was al always kind of uh, greater and more problematic for 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 the unity of, of of the so this could be done quite easily the same french king sometimes does it 
uh, against the, even the same bishop. So you see here all the various political combinations. In Italy, all is kind of more homogeneous in the sense that uh, as long as there, there was the lack of a solid central authority into the Italic kingdom proper, so the one that encompassed fundamentally central and southern Italy, including the papacy, so within the whole Roman Empire, this important kingdom that had remained, however, without a a local leader. Hmm? Uh, well, this autonomy led to the proliferation of the communes. That, in this sense, is also relatively homogeneous. I mean, aside from differences that have always to be stressed at a local level, I mean, how this commune was formed and so on, at the same time, the communal phenomenon in Italy has a very great homogeneity that stems from the you know, relatively homogeneity that exists in all these various cities that existed from Roman times, were kind of comparable size, they were all kind of uh, part now of a greater international circuit, um, commercial uh, interests and political so um, interests. So this all went relatively um, um, all at once, homogeneously, and that's also because, in fact, the, the cities of the Italic Kingdom had had also this previous common history, passing through, in fact, the ancient empire of Rome, then uh, the, the Longobard Kingdom, where uh, that had mm, had basically built itself over the cities and made them centers of of, of political direction, the legal direction. Um, the Longobard kingdom is shamefully overlooked in, in, in this process. Uh, it was incredibly advanced from a political and juridical point of view, uh, in spite of what, like, 99.9% of everybody who has ever heard about the Longobards thinks. Um, the, the, they had had the Carolingian times that also had been more disruptive than anything, but it had the, the house in Newtonian times they had had um, the, the, the Italian cities had been re, re, um, say reinforced in their importance that was continued at that point um, because of this thing of the the bishop count this idea of appointing the local bishops also of counts of the of the local city district therefore giving to the city in itself where the bishop believed a greater central authority that was eventually taken over by, as we've seen today, by the local, um, by the urban, um, the urban uh, classes, the lay classes, uh, to eventually re-expand into this district. Um, and the. Um, the commune is born in this sense with several characteristics in common, including the one of the most important magistrates that are elected this time, that were called usually, albeit not always, as consules, which is the Latin for consuls, in fact. Um, so the consul here had a. Um, it's important also in here the Roman continuity, because all over the early Middle Ages you find that. The, the the cities, um, the Italic cities, keep on also with their in their vocabulary and gone with their vocabulary and their political practice on very strongly Roman inspired at least models. So the idea of the consul as a, a magistrate, in fact, were usually two, like in ancient Rome. So there is a, a great continuity to this. That naturally stems from very different reasons uh, from which is uh, compared to the ones that brought Rome to have two consuls in ancient times. But they're kind of a bit the same because the consuls were usually, um, first of all, they were a military power. They were a military magistracy rather than a strictly political one, meaning that the consul, just like in ancient Rome, was the leader of the army. And given that these consuls in communal Italy were, in fact, normally drawn from the military class. They were, in fact, knights. They were professionals of war. And they were the ones who, in fact, had taken more 
yearly on the initiative to to seize power in the city to to expand their also the political and military power all around. That was all one with economical activity. You know, like the knights in the knights in Italy but also in the other especially in France and Germany, etc. They all have this kind of economical interests as well. But in in Italy they're particularly developed. In Italy the knights are both warriors and um uh, businessmen fundamentally. Uh, there is this hybrid that also increasingly structures and develops the um, Italian economical expansion at this time. They're the, one, the ones guiding them, guiding it. The populars emerge kind of later and paradoxically exactly from this great economical growth. So what is interesting in this is that you find that 11th and 12th century are in a certain sense the century of, the fe of feudalism even in com in, in the communes, because it's still the feudal military class that rules over this, and and the consuls eventually start just like in ancient Rome. They start initially they were all patricians, then eventually they become one patrician and one plebeian. The same happens in the Italian communes. At a certain point, the people, the commoners, uh, the populars, also want their representative. And of these two councils that existed, just like in Rome, it was a collegial magistracy. Uh, one came to be a popular, and the other one came, came to be a uh, knight. Uh, I mean, it remained a knight, um, a minus. Uh, this didn't happen in the same places in, um, in the same way. There were communes in which, in which this doesn't happen, uh, but more or less this is the trend that manifests um, itself in, in this communal world. And t for today we just stop to the consuls because eventually there are the potestas, etc. I explained this in other videos in communal Italy, but the important is now that you remember that the first magistracy of the communes was fundamentally the one of the consuls. It was a strictly military one. I mean, not only strictly, but um, or maybe strictly if you understand military rather as f for what military was at this time in terms of the medieval knighthood mm -hmm. and uh, this is particularly interesting because the <laughs> the knights at this point were kind of leading also the um, the shaping of this uh, communal institutions uh, the knights at this point were c deemed to be necessary to wage war uh, for the commune so they were not just the leaders, but they were also the ones that were uh, actively backed. I mean, the, these consuls had certain privileges, but not just as consuls. I mean, the, the whole knightly class within the city that was based on, on census had certain privileges. For instance, if they, um, if their horse was uh, killed in action or damaged, uh, there was a sort of tax that had to be paid for fixing it, for repairing it. Um, uh, it was called restaur, which is actually a Provencal term. For, it means to restore, to repay, to to. Um, which also tells you, by the way, how much this um, Italian Italic military class was influenced by the the uh, the courtly, feudal courtly uh, chivalry models that came that stemmed from Provence in literature at this time. So even this. Um, Italic kingdom is very close to Provence in culture um, and where the chivalry and um, the preeminence of, of knights is was fundamentally like in the other in the other countries. I'll bite with this important distinction of census because the knightly class at this point was considered even you know that that l um, condition of emergency that we discussed before in for the 10th century for the second invasion didn't come to an end here because now war kept being endemic even with the same development of of the communes that these communes started fighting against each other uh, this is a rule in the <laughs> medieval times you never stay in peace fundamentally and and therefore um the even the military participation was considered as fundamental like these knights were meant to to defend the commune to make it to 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 make it fight. Obviously, it was the same knightly class that fueled the wars, because they were the ones who you know 
who led uh, the operations, who were on ho fighting on horseback, who were making a living out of war uh, and, 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 and business related to war. Loot at this time was a, a very important mean of um, sustainment. They, uh, looting an enemy uh, district was, you know, a very. Uh, that's what all they they did fundamentally, and the populars were forced into this military operations. They normally didn't want because they were commoners, they were artisans, merchants. They were not about war. They didn't care. But at this time, the military class is powerful enough to to oblige them fundamentally to to make them follow. Also because they needed them in terms of you know if they had to besiege a castle, they needed enough infantrymen to to encircle it. They needed also this kind of, um, you know, artillery that is being developed in terms of catapults and trebuchets. I don't know whether you can call it artillery, but I think you understand these siege engines to say it better. Um, and they um, they had also the the populars start you know strengthening their power over the centuries. Also thinking about the crossbows and so on, but just think about the uh, the armor production. Yeah, you need art skilled artisans and, and also the horses, horse shows. All these technical things that only artisans among the, the populars can provide. And um, they. Uh, uh, so the, there is a need of cooperation, which is very conflictual, it's very dialectic within the city. Um, but it kind of works. Like communal Italy goes on literally like this for for one century and more, um, and it develops. It doesn't get weakened. It keeps expanding, and it keeps making war and keeps you know developing um, ever more sophisticated political systems, developing law, uh, develop, developing trade. Um, that's it. that's how it goes on, and. The at this time in this phase, uh, the, the military class, represented by the magistracy of the consuls, uh, is fundamentally the the protagonists. It's the prevailing force. Always given that um, there were also other actors into this. From one side you have this military aristocracy that we just described. From the other side you have the merchants. The managers fundamentally of commercial activities that were, um, and, and then the intellectual, the intellectuals also. Let's call them like this. I mean, the jurists, the, the teachers, the doctors, and so on. But there is also a compenetration of all of this. We have seen how the mil also the military aristocracy manages fundamentally trade, directs it, um, channels it in certain. Uh, in, invests in it importantly enough as we were saying before the city's fortune was born also because of the chiefly because of the agricultural resources that came from the countryside that the city develops as a marketplace in this sense so it was fundamentally the great feudal landed aristocrats that um, invest their agricultural products into the city because it's profitable for them, it's profitable for the city, they reinvest in it, they strengthen the city, make it become more powerful. Uh, many peasants also abandon the, pe the countryside to go into the city. That's how these cities actually grow. Um, the Italian uh, cities have a, a, an astonishing, uh, astonishing um, demographic growth, but it's not because they, they copulate in, in series repeatedly, it's because in pre-industrial times when you have this great demographic growth is because you know there are people migrating into one place not because they uh, because fertility rates were relatively I mean it was generally speaking survival rate was relatively low so also in here Europe is growing a lot but just for demographically speaking but for those time standards but that's not something so sensible what is sensible in here is the the enormous expansion of these cities that start being by the way larger city walls surpassing the Roman ones um, strengthening their control uh, creating new suburbs uh, suburbs and rain circle them with our new walls so a tumultuous growth that is very complicated now and, and going fast because I have to also to finish the video but it, it's still very important 
very important to repeat it because um, this is uh, incredible in the way it happened I would say um, at such a structural way in this European a region and how it went in parallel with a civil um, progress because as messy as, it w as this was this is the same reason why this communes started formulating new political theories, new juridical practices, um, expanding also at a technological level, etc. The, the, these were legitimately the most advanced areas in Europe, together perhaps with, with France at this time. Italy is also pioneers the uh, old, uh, siege um, technology. Uh, it's where the crossbow makes its greater development. It, it's really a, a hell of a place and the, the Italian communes had a lot of m of resources also to invest into such things. That's what the reason they were getting rich. And it's very complicated now. There are so many other videos. I made uh, a video sometimes, uh, um, some time ago on the material wealth of communal infantry, for instance. It's often overlooked. The infantry start to rise in Italy consistently. Um, as this other video, Chivas and Ominous in the Communal World, is particularly important. Ah, there is another video specifically on the consuls, so if you're interested about them, there is consuls in the communal world. It's often overlooked as a... Uh, that explains better what, what we were discussing today about the rise of the military class in the communal magistracies. or better, the, the, the founding on, on, of the communal magistracies by the, by the military aristocracy. So, there is another point that might seem secondary, but it kind of makes you better understand uh, how, sir, how the process really happened, uh, how progressive it was in many ways as well. That is, when were the, the single communes born? I mean, wh wh when do we know that the commune is born for the Now, this is another huge, huge capture. Uh, uh, oh my god. Sorry. I, I, uh, this is another huge chapter we should take hours and hours but to, to, to explain, but we can't. Just, just how we're staying in a bunch of things. First of all, for not for all communes, we basically know when precisely when the when the same are born we don't know uh, most I think in most cases or at least in many cases at least the uh, um, we, we start getting um, these documents pr produced by the communal governments um, that uh, when the community is already has already been born, uh, especially by the 11th and 12th century. We're talking about very primitive times in in history, let's say, um, in terms of documentary production. And consider that Italy, as we said before, is the center where you have more documents in absolute terms. But um, so, and even in here, it's rather sp sporadic, uh, and at least the one we we can get uh, so in um, certain um, Tuscan cities we know like Lucca and Pisa had a consular government already around the 1085 oh by the way this is the point that sometimes we don't actually hear the word commune but we mostly identify the commune by the consular through the consular institution I mean, w there was not even p properly a, um, you know, the, the, the consular magistracy was more important than the community itself. Because this was not, we now as moderns we think this like an institution that for us is solid, well-defined, permanent, etc. This is all kind of, we we reason from this only from, from two centuries for, fundamentally. Previously there was nothing like such a thing. Now, the commune simply meant, as we said before, that there were some colleges coming together forming this community. Point. This community had nothing particularly 
developed in it. It was just literally being a community, like abstractly speaking. What it was not abstract was the consular magistracy that actually governed the city. So that's the indicator we have in order to say, okay, the commune has started because we have the consuls. So if you have the consuls, that's where commune has started. Um, the task, this cities like Luca and Pisa are, were cities of ancient urbanization of uh, Luca was quite important uh, in the in Longobard Italy was kind of an important center um, connected was close to Pisa and to uh, also to Genoa so it wasn't an area it was important Pisa was a maritime republic as you know and this kind of favored in that area the uh, and also for other actually other reasons actually because Luca especially had a, a has an incredibly um rich um early medieval archive that has fortunately survived so we know for these two cities that the consuls existed as early as in 1085 which is very very old others um other cities were uh, having them Having consuls in fundamentally in, in the at the uh, in the following two decades, so fundamentally it's normal for a commune that is well, you know, developed for a city was well developed to to have a communal inst a consular institution between the the in, in the ne in the last two decades of the 11th century, the beginning of the of the 12th. Um, for instance, um, Genoa is also a maritime republic. Um, um, has the uh, actually we know that the commune was born. We we actually know the, the date. It is 1099, same year of the the end of the first crusade. Interestingly enough, and the um where Genoa also kind of had interests and so on. So it's all very intertwined with many. But in the case of Genoa, for instance, it's interesting to observe that there is that also in here the the, the social organization of the commune is not very clear. I mean this could really vary in many ways. We have in um, in Latin this compagna communis. By the way, um, compagna in here would be a um, or compagna. Uh, it literally comes from f f it's where company comes from. It comes from Latin, which means companis, which means a, an or, uh, a community, uh, an organization of people who eat bread together. Literally, that's where company ba basically means. You eat together bread. And and this Compagna Comunis in Genoa actually unites several different companies. So you see in here how the commune was born. There is no, uh, not really a central organization that says, okay, a central institution say, okay, let's build it like a permanent. No, it's fundamentally a, a contract between several um, guilds, several communities. Um, uh, in the case of Genoa, they were especially rooted on the um, city, uh, on the base of the city districts. Mm -hmm. Genoa will maintain these characteristics even, uh, even in at the acme of its uh, power, um, creating problem to it because fundamentally in Genoa, Genoa is the example of an extremely powerful maritime republic. At one point, it will come to literally finance the the wall. Spanish Empire, um, but it will never be a state like Genoa. Basically, in, in, uh, like Venice. Sorry, Venice was much better structured in, like, more as a state. Uh, particularly interesting in the, the way it worked uh, it was much more, much more institutional. Genoa remained fundamentally a cluster of families, of private businesses in this sense. Um, Genoa, you can argue, at the end of the Middle Ages, was not even the city in itself or the commune in itself, uh, the, the Republic, uh, as it was called, but it was fundamentally the Bank of St. George. Was literally, the city was the bank. 
and the bank was the city. So you can understand the degree of privacy that that existed in these institutions. I mean, it w they were really created in a very spontaneous way, and they remained in many cases sort of private association. Naturally, not in so many cases because uh, eventually the commune, yeah, kind of develops as kind of a more permanent thing with its own traditions and bodies. So it kind of sclerotizes, crystallizes into something more well defined, but uh, more well defined, better defined. But um, it starts like any other medieval universitas, as it was called at the time. So every every commu uh, literally every single community in the Middle Ages has a sort of university that is basically just a bunch of people who have a common interest and start it like a company, in fact, because that's the that's the idea. And in the case of Genoa, uh, there's um, several companies that made up the Compagna Comunis, so the company of the commune, um, are made up by the uh, the eminent families of the milites and the uh, entrepreneurs and uh, merchants, fundamentally. So it's kind of both things together, the feudal military element and the commercial mercantile one that create this commune to make a freaking lot of money together through sea trade and uh, ship buildings and expanding the the capabilities of of the city's projection on on the sea and uh and becoming what the, the Genoese uh maritime empire would would would, would become um a special mention, I believe, before closing is uh, for Milan. Milan at this time becomes fundamentally the largest city in Europe. is um, is a monster, literally. It's it's something enormous, and it's the one that will cause, you know, in fact, in the 12th century, the you know the the expedition uh, of Frederick Barbarossa, as we remember, not just because of that, but you know, it's um, um, as we we said before. The expedition, uh, the imperial expeditions, was meant to 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 uh, stop the Milanese expansion over the other communes at this time. So Milan is doing something incredible that other communes at this time was were not making because were too small to expand their power on them. So Milan instead has this very great um, uh, uh, actor that uh, is full of resources. It can use them to expand even over other communes. So it is particularly interesting because eventually even if you see what the the, 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 the fate of the surrounding cities historically will be, is that Milan basically swallows them all and uh, the, creates this Lombard regional state. It takes time, but in here, we don't know when the commune was born, for instance, it's typical, it's kind of the most important commune, but we don't know when the commune is born properly, but the first consular government is witnessed since 1117. Uh, and in here um, you find, uh, when you look at the composition of the commune, um, you you find uh, also another uh, specific characteristics of, of Milan, that it was such a, a, a big um, system that fundamentally n until the Visconti Lordship Back in the in, in the late thirteenth century, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, eventually in the late thirteenth century, no, um, no class is able to take over the city for real. This is particularly important because normally in, in all the other cities, uh, you find uh, always, obviously, always an equilibrium between all the various social stands. Uh, so the people, the bishop, the the knights, etc. In Milan, it, it's complicated because it, these systems are all so big on their own that they can, they kind of can't, they, they, and, and, and society remains stratified in that fashion. So in the other cities, you find the alternation of this. First, usually there is the bishop rules, then comes the knights, then the people. In here, it's it, it it's it's really not like that. In fact, the commune comprehends in Milan the chivas, so the people, that would be the citizens. Then the Capitane, 
that would be a sort of uh, here I, I really don't remember but I think it's like the um, this kind of local it's the the urban elite fundamentally that has also some military um, military character um, and we're talking about I think still either popular or so some kind of elite that has to do with the local government etc and the valvasores the valvasores are fundamentally are sub vassals that have a more strictly military characterization and these are the three stands to guide the city but as a matter of fact Milan is composed by fundamentally the bishop because the archbishop of Milan is very important has a huge power historically speaking Milan was one of the great dioceses it, it, it was uh, it um, uh, with sand and bros, it, it, there is a great tradition that the, the, the Milanese diocese is also pretty large. Uh, in fact, the Pope at a certain point reduces it because um, the Pope himself, by the way, um, it then there is the the people, so the popular classes, and the uh, the milites, the knights. So this elements are so big and cumbersome all by one it basically counterbalance each other and in the mi meanwhile however the, the city still manages to expand uh, this is particularly interesting because in in the communes normally uh, it's the people that assume a, a greater role instead Milan that is a symbol of uh, Guelphism of a great trade commercial city commercial center uh, also, with a sort of proto-industrial activity, that eventually is developed, especially in armory production and stuff like that. Never has the people reaching the top. Never. This is particularly interesting, and um, it's also ironically, and this is a bit the fate of all the Lombard uh, cities in perspective, especially in compared to Tuscany, where fundamentally the the strongest lordship um, is affirmed historically, the Visconti one. Uh, not really the first, but d definitely the one to which you know the this commune had fought for, had been fighting also under uh, Frederick, uh, you know, under, against the Swabians, etc., against this impositions of the r single ruler, etc. Instead, it's the one that will transform itself into the kind of the strongest lordship in in um in Italy in this sense and this is interesting because it gi it 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 um it gives you a sort of um there is a progression that today we didn't discuss because we are looking just at the origin of the commune but it's still important to remember that uh, there is a, an evolution of these communes they all follow a kind of a similar trend um, you don't have to force this. There is nothing even. There's sort of. Uh, I hate, for instance, when you, people make biological comparisons with political entities because it absolutely doesn't, didn't work like that. But in the case of the Lombard communes, you see that they are the ones that would develop earlier. But this progressivity brings, in fact, to a, a, a greater st social stratification like in Milan. Milan becomes an, an incredibly important city but it still has you know this s social segmentation that kind of remains more or less the same because there is always the people who remains more or less at the same level. There is always the knightly class who remains at a certain level. There is always the bishop who remains there. And eventually this system dies out because there is a crisis of the system etc and chooses a lord. With Tuscany it's not like that. The Tuscan communes uh, emerge later, but they emerge in a much quicker way, for which basically all the wealth is concentrated, um, I mean at least most of the wealth is concentrated into the hands of the so-called popular classes that emerge uh, all together, so they also form a very strong homogeneous body compared to, to the rest of Italy and they develop therefore they are able even to overthrow in some of the cases the, the nice definitely um, and to form mostly in this sense a republican regime tradition that eventually also in Tuscany kind of enters in crisis and so on but let's say that this is a, a, an important uh, distinction um, this kind of strong peoples exists also into uh, the Emilia region 
this is largely an agricultural one uh, and also in, partly in Piedmont uh, and then yeah there were a bunch of other strong popular centers like Bologna and Padua but uh, those are yeah they're also very big uh, big centers although they, they, they finished to be to, to be crushed by external seniors and then to develop seniority also on their own so but this is just for anecdotal for now um, so um, this is more or less what I have to say as you understand there is a freaking lot to tell about this um, it's an incredible chapter in my opinion medieval history incredibly overlooked um, and um, we should talk more about this because it, it's really been a, a really big thing and we need to, to tell the story of this because um, you can't tell the Middle Ages without talking about Italian communities, it doesn't make any any sense because these were kind of the, the balance point of the world, the international, the European political balance and uh, whatever happening here dictated many things that were happening also elsewhere um, especially from an economical point of view etc but not all and okay so for now I stop here I will definitely keep making videos on this topic and I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it or wisely a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.